Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink, inspiring public curiosity about food. Learn more at mofad.org. This week on Meet and 3, we bring you stories about the coldest, darkest season. We start in a California vineyard. It's cold, but it's wet, and things are still alive. There's a lot of life in this soil. We explore two frontiers of cocktail culture, luxury ice and the rise of non-alcoholic drinks. The rocks traditionally becomes 25% of your drink's volume, and as such, it imparts smells and tastes. And we investigate the risks facing New York City delivery workers during the harsh winter. In the wintertime, after two hours of biking, it's quite easy, actually, for the bikes to sing upside down or slips or slide. Tune in to this week's episode of Meat and 3, that's M-E-A-T plus sign T-H-R-E-E, for some food for thought to sustain you through the dead of winter. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello, and welcome to A Hungry Society. I'm Korsha Wilson, and this is the show where we talk about food, food media, and so much more. Today's guest is Shannon Mustafer, spirits educator, cocktail consultant, and expert on the topic of rum and cane spirits. In 2014, she became the beverage director of Gladys Caribbean in Brooklyn and supported cocktails in settings ranging from neighborhood pubs to Michelin-starred restaurants. In addition to working with a number of spirits brands across a range of categories, she is one of the founding members of Women Leading Rum, an organization dedicated to providing education and professional development for industry and trade professionals. In 2018, she launched Women Who Tiki, a tropical cocktail-centric pop-up that gathers a team of women bartenders to share their talents and collaborate on creating a one-night-only experience, which has been featured at Rumba Seattle, Tiki Oasis, and the New York Cocktail Expo. Shannon's writing, cocktail recipes, and opinions have been featured in a number of publications, including Punch.com, GQ, Liquor.com, New York Magazine, and more. Next month, she is releasing her first book called Tiki, Modern Tropical Cocktails, and it's available for pre-order right now on Amazon, and it's number one, just so you know. I don't know. You probably do know. Already. Yeah, I was delighted to see that last it's, week. It's number one in beverages. In new releases, correct. Yeah, yes. it's, that's so amazing. So, Shannon, welcome to Hungry Society. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really happy to have you. So, we met, I guess, a week ago. I know. This is moving so <laughs> fast. Our, We're moving fast. Our friendship is developing so <laughs> quickly. Um, we did not meet in New York. We met in New Orleans at this fantastic conference. Um, you were on a panel about beverages, and it it was so incredible that I, like, bum-rushed you while you were having a smoke break. I'm very sorry, but I'm not that sorry because <laughs> you're here now. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to say that if you want to get where you want to go in life, you just got to get in there. You cannot wait. You know, no no waiting for permission. So I'm glad that, you know, 
you took those necessary steps. I'm glad <laughs> that, here. that you're here now and you're a guest on the show. Love being here at Heritage Radio. So thank um, you. So also happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> We're going to talk about one of my favorite loves. And I think one of your favorite loves, rum. All right, shoot. <laughs> so during the, um, the panel that you were a part of in New Orleans, you talked about how rum is kind of this, this window into, uh, into or onto the, the entire world. Uh, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so I'll just start with um, the fact that rum is produced in over 90 countries around the world. And it is, by virtue of that, the most diverse spirit as well as, you know, the one that, you know, based on all these different production methods that you find, even within one country, it is, I would say, like, each one is different. You know, to call rum one category doesn't really do it justice or tell you much you know there's such a huge range and each rum I think can show you a little bit about the place it comes from in terms of how the flavor profiles go with the food or you know the way people drink rum in different cultures can you know give you some insight into what the values are there or you know what people are into generally and overall you know compare that to scotch whiskey you know it comes from one place or likewise you know tequila and mezcal they come from mexico you know which is also a really rich and diverse culture but again it's not a, a global culture mm. um and then you know the other part that we don't like to talk about too much is uh you know the economics of rum and the fact that the sugar industry was the first big global industry you know on the scale of, of finding uh oil you know, so the the money that was derived from sugar and rum production here in the Americas is the basis of our modern economy. And it was also the money that was used to fuel the Industrial Revolution, which was something that was necessary in order to grow that industry to the scale that it got to be. So, you know, it's, I would say, uh, very foundational to the way we live today. Mm. So um, to back it up a little bit, how did you uh, come to the beverage world? Uh, what, what brought you to hospitality in general, but specifically to beverages? Yeah, so um, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, and really big extended family. My grandfather on my mother's side is just like big, larger than life, really gregarious guy. And over the summers, we'd have, you know, big family gatherings in the backyard and, you know, grilling and doing crab boils. I mean, this man was really serious about it. He had a shed. You know, some people have like a shed with like a freezer and like some beers. Like he had a dedicated freezer for meat, one for seafood, and then another one for beer. So, <laughs> so it was almost like a small scale restaurant and, you know, just seeing that and uh, enjoying those times and, I, I don't know. I was always into hosting. It always looked like a lot of fun. So this is a little roundabout, but I think that's where it all began. And then in college, I started hosting dinner parties. And, you know, we didn't do beer. You know, we didn't do the, the whole kind of frat thing. Like, I do bottled Manhattans and martinis. You know, I tried to oh, wow. be a little more elevated with it. I mean, you know. This was back, in college? This is, like, towards the end of college. Wow. And, you know, mind you, this is back in the day where, like, you can't really get good vermouths, and I didn't know to put it in the refrigerator, so, like, don't. <laughs> I'm not okay. trying to give the impression of being, like, a prodigy or anything, but, uh, uh, yeah, that that's it. And then my first job in hospitality was actually Starbucks, which I thought was really cool because the manager there mm -hmm. was so top-notch with his hospitality and watching the way that he spoke to the guests and made their experience really wonderful, was like, this is how it needs to be done. And I was like, I want to be that good. And I got obsessed with coffee. Like, I could pull shots out of a porter filter and look at the color and the rate that it was coming out, and I knew what it was going to taste like. Wow. And I had guests that would, you know, pass on getting coffee if I wasn't working that day. <laughs> My wow. coworkers would be like, yeah, homegirl came in. She said no. I was like, yep. <laughs> they want she what knows. I have. So <laughs> so that was uh, almost 20 years ago. And uh, when I moved to New York a decade ago, I was working in the photo industry as a styling and props assistant. And I worked in restaurants on the side, did some work in wine bars, became a buyer for a few projects. And then five years ago, 
shifted to working full time behind cocktail bars. Hmm. Yeah, um, that came out during your panel too about um, how you have like this photography background, which I feel like would be such um, a, a clutch skill to have when working on a book about cocktails. Like to know about like photo composition and art composition um, is just so key. I, I bet a lot of people who write books, cookbooks or cocktail books in particular, wish they had that skill. Well, here's the thing, you know, I studied visual art and art history at Rhode Island School of Design. And that was, I don't, I don't know, almost like a, a monk when it came to it. Like on Saturday mornings, I get up at seven, lock myself in the studio. And sometimes my friends would come to retrieve me from the studio. <laughs> they're like, girl, wow. they're like, no, 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 we're going to go hang out. Like, What, it's, what it time would they do that? Uh, well, my phone was off, so they'd have to hunt around because wow. I had a couple studios. <laughs> That's intense. Because I don't want people to find me. But yeah, um, I was really into it. And, you know, I was the one kid who was wide awake in the art history lecture. <laughs> I was like, totally into it. But this being said, yes, um, when my photographer and I, No Effects, started to concept out this book, we knew that the visuals were going to be really central to how we were going to make a unique offering to the cocktail book space. And we did reference art history. And if you're savvy and you know how to look at it, you will see references to particular mm. artworks. Wow. And uh, yeah, I wasn't at the mercy of an art director or an editor. I was able to be on set. I was able to contribute to the styling. And you know, I wanted to see a book that would be a reflection of how I would make an image as much as it's a reflection of how I approach making cocktails. Hmm. Well, I, I cannot wait to hold it and see it. We can do that now. What, you have one? I have a galley. Oh, can I see it? Let's do it right now. Yeah, okay. hold on for a second, okay? Okay. Hold on. Yep. I'll entertain mm. the listener by <laughs> saying how excited I am while you grab it. Um, but I think it's so interesting that you focus on tiki. For your, wow, this is gorgeous. Um, I think it's so interesting that you focus on tiki because I think people, when they hear tiki, think of kind of... I Tiki is such a particular thing. Actually, this is a good question for you. Yes. What kind of uh, preconceived notions about tiki do you think most people have or are you confronted with often? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with the, the preconceived notions I had when I opened up the program at Gladys. Um, you know, sweet, kind of tacky, a little throwback, you know, wasn't positive. And I think that had a lot to do with the fact that at that juncture, I'd not had a lot of exposure to Tiki. Um, I loved Painkiller when it was open, and they did a wonderful job. But there are so many places that, you know, are Tiki in name, you know, but not really in terms of the quality Mm. You know, that's changed dramatically in the last two or three years. But again, five years ago, it wasn't really happening in New York. And so, you know, when I opened up Gladys, you know, the real motivation or the focus was to bring together the best selection of traditional as well as what I call innovation rooms. And by innovation, I'm referring to um, brands that you don't find on the islands, but the liquids are sourced from older distilleries on the islands and you know, they're crafted in a way to recall, you know, those older flavor profiles that predate, you know, mass-produced rums, okay? So I knew that a lot of our guests were going to be skeptical regarding rum as they had not had a lot of experience tasting it. And uh, opening menu was very focused on Cuban-style cocktails and, like, really clean and dry, mm. elegant cocktails that, you know, could, uh, you know, people could make a link between, let's say, for instance, a daiquiri and a gin gimlet, or, you know, I make old-fashioned variations, like things that were comforting and familiar. Uh, about, I'm going to say, eight months to a year in, I had the opportunity to go to the first Tiki by the Sea, and there I had a fateful meeting with Brother Cleve, who has a, a recipe in that book, Thank You, BC. Wow. And, uh, um, I haven't heard that name in a minute. Oh, um, he's the OG, and it, he uh, also has a, a playlist that he contributed to this book, so you can listen to the jams while you get your, your cocktails ready. That's um, great. But yeah, um, you know, seeing Brother Cleve's seminar, as well as the other seminars there, helped me to realize that of all the bars in my part of Brooklyn, if not all of Brooklyn at the time, I was the best equipped to execute good 
tiki drinks because of you know what I had at my disposal spirit wise and at that point I was like okay you got to do this like if you really want to represent your rums now it's time to start to put these drinks on the menu mm. so my tie went on and it's undergone some tweaks over the years but there is literally like a, a cult around it like we had a regular who would come in once a week for her Mai Tai like it wow. was intense that's and actually a very good I need to institute that tradition I think I mean whatever you like make sure you get <laughs> enough of it but that being said you know the more time I spent learning about Tiki and you know reading the Jeff Beach Bum Berry books and getting the Trader Vic books and it just became really apparent that it's a rich category. It's very culinary. The the types of flavors that you utilize and the multiple ingredients, it takes a lot of sophistication and, and savvy to balance those. And again, uh, I had a misconception that it was maybe a little lowbrow, but the more I looked into it, I was like, hey, if, if you really want to master the cocktail game, this is a challenging genre to do that in. Mm. And now you know when i make drinks outside this particular category i think they're so much better for having spent so much time working with tiki cocktails Mm. i think it's really interesting that um one there's the you use the word lowbrow with how you originally saw uh the genre of tiki cocktails which i think is like i think a lot of people hold that same sort of um opinion of the genre uh before they've really like explored it and it's interesting like juxtaposing that with what we talked about like the kind of history of of rum and it being kind of like you you likened it to oil the oil industry so like it has this complex history and like foundational history but it's still seen as like oh it's just fun and you know there's a flame in the middle of your scorpion bowl and a long straw like how fun and you just get drunk but it's like deeply complex absolutely and you know to be fair when tiki first arrived on the scene in la in the late 30s it was uh very geared towards entertainment and those spaces were among the most expensive build outs of any restaurant or style of restaurant that you know you you saw back then and even today and there was a really serious element of craft around the cocktails at that juncture and around the style of service and, you know, what you could expect from being in those spaces. So, yeah, it definitely had uh, an escapist element to it. And as time went on, you start to see elements like, you know, the thatch was there from the beginning and, you know, canoes and waterfalls. And I think, you know, in some instances, it's kind of veered off into a lighter, poppier direction. Mm. But, um, yeah, it was always meant to be fun, for sure. But just because something's fun doesn't mean it's not, you know, some serious thought and craft and work that goes into it. Right. And there's a, just looking at these cocktails, there's a ton of craft and work that you put into these. Like, not only do I want to drink all of these, um, but they're, I just saw a drink that had, like, um, it was an apple or pineapple cider with velvet falernum and um, a, a dram of some kind in there as well. Allspice dram, if I recall. Yeah. Yes. Like yes. that's, uh, I just, and I was just thinking, oh, that's so brilliant to like build a cocktail. Or I guess, it, would it be technically a shandy? What would you call it? It's basically that? a Caribbean shandy. Yeah, like yeah. building that into a can of cider. Like what a, that's such a great way to approach like, you know, building a cocktail in like a, a different sort of way. Yeah, I mean, what we what I wanted to see happen in the book was, you know, a little something for everybody, right? So some people want to go all out and do nine ingredient cocktails, so you know, that's there for you. But if you want to keep it easy and you don't have like a, a giant bar or you don't feel your skill level is, you know, quite there yet, you can start with something really simple and still get like a complex end result flavor wise. So. Mm-hmm. I wanted all the drinks to be really gratifying for the reader, regardless of how simple or how complex it was. Mm. What do you, you know, you you want people to clearly make the cocktails. I but, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but what what else do you want people to ultimately walk away with after they've they've read your book? So you know, regarding people who spend time with cocktail books, I hope that our approach to the design and the photography and the visuals will 
offer up some ideas and inspiration for a new way to go about making these books and depicting cocktails and the kind of the space and the imagery that we take you to, right? Because that's what cocktails, when they're really working, they do, right? It's not just what's in the glass or what's in front of you. It evokes a place, a mood, a memory, like something you did before, something you really want to do in the future. So I want the book to basically, I want you to read it like you're drinking a cocktail, so to speak, and be transported. Mm. And then, you know, the other thing on a more practical side is I don't, I'm not making this about, hey, these are the cocktails that you need to know how to make because they're mine. It's not that, you know, because they're not totally mine. They're inspired by classics. They're inspired by the work of my colleagues in the industry. And, you know, we're all here sharing ideas and expertise. And so they're the head notes and the way we walk you through the recipes from the beginning to end are meant to help you get a, a really good sense of ingredients and flavor. Mm. And, uh, you know, I talk about how certain elements will have the final impact in the end result. And so you can take this, I hope, you know, if you're savvy and you like to cook, you can take some insight from here and learn how to build some flavor combinations for your dishes mm. and then make your own cocktails, tiki or otherwise, based on that, that knowledge of, of palate. Is there a combination that you can uh, think of right now of like a cocktail and something you would definitely cook with it? This is I didn't I didn't prep you for this question, but just yeah. for listeners, you know, who are who are thinking about you know getting the book, like what should they think about? Okay, so this one is just like really fun and off the cuff, and I know this is not for everybody, but if you enjoy like like a banana brulee, you know, it's a fun dessert. Mm-hmm. Uh, you look at. A cocktail there that has banana milk and it has a couple rums in it. It has like a demerara rum. So there's like a little bit of this kind of burnt char on it. And then if my memory is correct, I think there's some banana as well. So if you take those flavors in there and there's also some cinnamon and, and allspice, think of it as kind of like a bananas foster dessert. Wow. Yep. Um, I'm not a banana fan. Yeah. But not for everybody. <laughs> but it still sounds good. I mean, that's the one ingredient I have to, like, slap my hand when I'm, when I'm reaching for it. Because, like, if, if I had my way, it would be in almost all my drinks. But really? I, I just can't get enough of it. <laughs> Do you have um, another, like, favorite ingredient? Or do, do you have a favorite cocktail that is in the book? I love all my children. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> there's one drink. It's really simple. And I, I think that... It's the one that kind of opened a gateway for me to feel like I had a, a very deep and personal connection to what I was doing. And it's called a parasol. Again, deceptively simple. It's a banana and, and pineapple daiquiri. And I got the idea when I was hanging out with my local. And, uh, you know, Candace Ross, who does Brin's Jams. Nice plug there for you. It's really an amazing line. Every flavor I've tasted in the line is delicious. Brin's Jams? Brin's Jams. Is that um, here in New York or is it somewhere else? So, yeah, based here, and I think some of the production might take place in Louisiana, where Candace is from. Um, it was originally Stag Jams, so they recently rebranded. But you know, Candace gave me a jar of one of her first batches of banana jam, and without thinking, I just turned to the bartender and said, make me a daiquiri with this. <laughs> And I gave him some specs, and it was so good. Uh, you can't, uh, just for listeners, don't <laughs> just, do not do that at every bar. You, you have to have to. a relationship, and we had a really good relationship, and we still do. In fact, for those of you who live in Brooklyn, King Thai Bar, this is where this took place, will be hosting me for a week beginning on March 28th, a few weeks after the, the book drops. We're going to do a menu takeover there. So for seven days, you can come in and... Try some cocktails from the book. And one more time, the dates on that and the place. Yeah, so King Thai Bar. Okay. It's on Bergen near Notrin and Crown Heights. I'm going to launch it on March the 29th and run that menu until the following week, which I, I believe wraps up on April 6th. Wow. Okay, so I'll be there. I would um, love it if you were. Uh, Corey and I will come because we love tiki drinks of all kinds and... Yours look amazing. Um, oh, I'm just, you know, just spitballing here. You should take that on the road. You should you should do that all over the country. Oh, don't you worry. The <laughs> the dates are set. 
the <laughs> most of the plane tickets are bought. So if you go to my website, it's just my first and last name, no dots or anything, dot com. You'll see a list of all the pop-ups I'm planning for the year. And I'm really excited to say that my first West Coast pop-up will be at Trader Vic's in Emeryville. Oh, wow. And, you know, Eve Bergeron, I had an opportunity to meet her a few years ago. And she was really kind to contribute a blurb to my, my book jacket. And she reached out and invited me to do it there, which is beyond flattering. As I have it, you know, the, the Wayne's World, Tia Marimo, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. Because <laughs> the, the Mai Tai, again, as I mentioned, was that first cocktail that, that helped me to, you know, take it seriously. And the Mai Tai is, I don't know, I can't, can't get enough of it. And so to launch there in the, the home of the Mai Tai, it's going to be fantastic. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with Shannon Mustafer, and we'll talk more about tiki drinks in a minute. This episode is brought to you by MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink. Featuring a variety of interactive displays, MOFAD encourages eaters of all ages to be curious about food. The museum currently operates MOFAD Lab, a 5,000 square foot experimental space in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where Chow, making the Chinese American restaurant, is currently on show until the end of March, 2019. This exhibition celebrates the birth and evolution of Chinese American restaurants, tracing their nearly 170 year history and sparking conversations about food culture, immigration, and what it means to be American. It highlights the evolution timeline of Chinese American restaurant menus dating back to 1910 and also highlights a tasting section where participants get to enjoy tastings created by the country's most talented chefs who specialize in Chinese-American cuisine. Make sure you check out Chow while you still can. The exhibition closes at the end of March 2019. Check out MoFAD's tastings and extensive event calendar at mofad.org slash events. So we are back with Shannon Mustafer, um, bar- cocktail expert, author whose book is dropping in March, and possibly my favorite guest ever because during the commercial break, she showed me like three bottles of rum in her bag and poured <laughs> and poured me some rum into a cup. Um, wow. What hospitality, Shannon? <laughs> I can't get it out of my system. <laughs> Just she looks at me and goes, "Do you want some rum?" Like, yes, actually, I would love some rum. Look, I'm from the south. It's rude to be a guest and not bring anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, what what kind of rum is this? This is from Panama, and it's sourced from La Cabras, which is a really cool distillery and a project that is run by Don Pancho. Don Pancho is a seminal figure in rum in that he was once, and this is a real job title, he was a minister of rum in Cuba wow. and ran Havana Club until the 90s. It was acquired by another company, and at which point he decided to leave. And he went to Panama and began working as a consultant with numerous brands, doing everything from distillation, aging, advising, mm-hmm. basically one-stop shop. So he had his bottles from there and... It's meant to evoke the style and the flavor of old school Cuban rums from the 40s. Wow, it's delicious. Just even the nose on it is like uh, caramelly and, and amazing. It's nice and dry. It's nice and dry. Again, like one of those things that defies the expectation of what someone's looking for or think they're going to get in a Spanish style rum, which a lot of people write off as is, is too sweet. Mm. But um, no, it works. So the commercial break um, was brought to us by MoFad, 
uh, the Museum of Food and Drink, and you are actually doing an event there soon. Yes, um, next Thursday on the 21st. I'm really excited for this as the Rousseau sisters will be there launching their book, Provisions, and in conversation with Julia Tertian. And I will be serving up a slate of Caribbean cocktails. And I'm very excited to meet them. I love MoFed. I've worked numerous events there. And the, the crew is, they're wonderful. They take good care of everyone. And that's next week. So if you don't have tickets, I would suggest doing it. Get them it. quick. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> going to be um, sampling out some dishes from Provisions as well. So I'm like, this is going to be a delicious night. Yes. yes. Um, Jamaican food and rum cocktails. I mean, what else? Could you want? And Julia and the Rousseau sisters have, you know, both have separate episodes of A Hungry Society. So this is full circle. Go back into the archives. Yes. Listen up. Listen. <laughs> listen Get to the them ball all. Get the picture, yeah. Yes. Um, I, I can't wait to be there. I'm going to be there, so. Loving it. Yeah. Um, so usually in the second half of the show, we talk about kind of your c- connection to dining and, and, and what brought you to the food world. Um, you already mentioned your, your grandfather's house and the parties that he would throw. Um, how many people are we talking? In anywhere from, I mean, at minimum, we're talking about 20, right? Mm. And then 40. No, it was, it was no joke. Like that kitchen was like a mini restaurant kitchen. We had everybody in there. So, you know, again, like experiencing that firsthand and also being from Charleston, you know, parents on my father's side, they come from the rural area. We own farm land still outside of Savannah. And uh, it's, it's Geechee, Geechee Gullah culture. So mm. I grew up watching my grandma, you know, making lima beans and ham hocks. And sometimes we had pig's feet and chicken feet and turtle. So it's like, for me, like seeing the animal, like the whole animal. <laughs> and then natural. seeing the <laughs> dish. Yeah, like, so there's no... Now, disconnected, I know a lot of people in our generation have. Like, you go to the store, and it's in a package, or someone made it for you. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm seeing the, the feathers on the chicken still. Yeah. You know? So, um, you know, that combined with eating mostly home-cooked meals growing up, mm-hmm. I just loved it, and uh, I wanted to share it with my friends. And the more I did, the more I realized I just wanted to keep sharing. And uh, that's what again, brought me into the, the restaurant world. Like, I love to host. Like, I, I'll, I'll just tell you a little little story. I was uh, working as barista, and uh, one of my customers was like, and he's, he looked confused. He was like, you, you really like doing this, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. some people are be- begrudgingly in hospitality because they're trying to make money, mm-hmm. you know, but I was like, yeah, I really do, <laughs> with, like, this big, like, grin on my face. I'm like, yeah, I really do love serving you. So, oh, that's that, great. That's that, yeah. Um, can you uh, kind of explain Gullah Geechee culture a little bit for listeners who maybe aren't familiar with it? Yes, yes. So, Gullah uh, Geechee Gullah culture is found on the coast of South Carolina and Georgia, and there are also some islands called the Sea Islands off there. And those communities were started by former slaves who escaped from plantations, and you know, at this stage, we're talking um, late 18th century, you know, not too far removed from having, you know, been in Africa or maybe like a generation later. So those communities were growing rice and, uh, you know, you can still find people who weave baskets and do other crafts that Hmm. are basically identical to similar work that you'll find on the west coast of Africa. Uh, Most Individuals of color who are born in Charleston and area, we believe or understand are descended from people from Sierra Leone or from uh, from Senegal. My name, Mustafa, is a creolization of Mustafa. Is that part of Africa that was predominantly Muslim? And um, yeah, the culture retains a lot of Africanism. So, mm. just a, a little example. In terms of speech, I did a little bit of a, a patois. And sentence and grammar structure resembles the same grammar and sentence structure that you'll find in certain African languages. Mm. So instead of saying, for instance, oh, I told her to go to the store and, and get some flour, 
my grandma would say, I had tell she to go to the store for get some flour. So, you know, that's how it's all set up. And, um, you know, I didn't know a lot about it when I was young. We didn't really talk about that aspect of our background. But again, I, I think, you know, coming from that, I, I feel like I have more of a connection to, to food. You know, we didn't change our food ways too much as a result of being here in the Americas. And yeah, that's that's part of what Geechee Gullah is. I'm, hmm. I'm not an expert, but I, I, mean, I hope that I th- helps I you. Think, I mean, you grew up in it. You, yeah. you are. Um, I, I just wanted to tease that out a little bit mm-hmm. because I think it's such a, a special thing. I had um, I did an interview with a chef, uh, Chef Pierre Thiam, mm-hmm. um, who was from Western Africa, and um, he just opened up a restaurant in Harlem called Taranga, and he was saying that Gullah Geechee culture, like the first time he went, there was just such a direct line. From West Africa. Like he was shocked. I'm sure yeah. he was shocked. He yeah. was like, I was in, in Africa. Africa. Yep. Like it's um it's such like this like beautiful, complete line of um of culture and of food and of hospitality. So it's it's really interesting that you made your way to hospitality and like really love it because it's 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 very much present in, in Western Africa. Absolutely. Which I've yet to visit. I've had an opportunity to go to other parts of the continent, but yeah, I need to get back to my roots for sure. So, um, what kind of food did your did your grandfather serve at these parties? Every type of seafood imaginable, <laughs> and hence my current obsession with anything with a shell. So, he was friends with guys who fished, and mm. every Saturday he'd go down to the docks and whatever they had. Right. So sometimes it was conch, shark. And again, like this is like very like Afro Caribbean. Like a, a lot of my friends didn't grow up eating stuff like this. So, crabs, crawfish, like whatever. It was all over the map. I really enjoyed our crab boils. We call them crab cracks mm. in Charleston. You know, a little different from Maryland. Like yeah, I grew up in Maryland. Oh, so yeah, yeah. So crab boil is very familiar. Oh and God, big those are like part my heart. Days. When I saw the bushels of crabs, like I was just like, yes, it's gonna yep. be a day. And so. You know, not only would we do those, but we sit together as a family on the porch and, you know, take the meat out and do what we call deviled crabs. So for those of you not familiar, deviled crab is kind of like a similar principle. It's like a deviled egg, right? So you take the egg, roll it, cut it in half, take the um, the yolk out, and then add your seasonings and put it back in. So same thing with the crab. You take all the meat out, you reserve the carapace, and then you add, like, all your seasonings to the meat and put it back in, and then bake it or broil it and drizzle it with butter and put herbs on top Mm. oh god it was the best (laughs) i mean it was so labor intensive we'd be on that porch for like three or four hours but worth it oh beyond worth it beyond uh we should do a a crab feast together i again you don't have to ask like just say yes you shouldn't get me wrong because i like (laughs) just have ideas i just start it's okay i mean isn't this how our relationship began (laughs) You're like, I need to talk to you. And I I'm like, to- ah, I need a minute from the crowd. And now, yeah, flash forward to a week later. I'm like, we should do a crab boil together. You know, I need to be careful around you, okay? What what else am I going to agree to before this is right. all over? There's going to be, a, like, you're going to have a lineup of events here, Maryland, South oh, Carolina. Man. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so I like to ask every guest, uh, is there a restaurant experience that kind of, that stands out in your memory as sort of, like, formative for you? You know, I should have thought about this before I got here, <laughs> but uh, you know, there's so many. It's it's really difficult to to talk about one. I've had the opportunity to dine in all kinds of environments. You know, from shacks on the beach in Martinique. You know, getting down on some crawfish, what they call ecrevi, and it's like a catch-all. You never know which which fish you're actually gonna. It could be like a giant prawn or shrimp or whatever but I digress so um (laughs) well here's one a blast in the past a little known fact about Rhode Island and uh Providence area in particular is that in the 70s the state had really welcoming uh I would say policies towards people who are fleeing areas affected by war Okay, so... Wow. Yeah, so um, 
a sizable population of people from Cambodia and Laos live there, as do individuals from various Caribbean islands, Cape Verde, West Africa. And you know, add to that the fact that it's a really rich Italian-American community there as well. And so, I mean, there's Johnson & Wells, too, for those of you who are familiar with that school. So food, right? So I'm, I'm at RISD studying painting, but I'm really studying eating, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, you know, I, I had some, some friends who were, like, really into the food. So, like, one night is Korean food, and one night we're going to get Italian on Federal Hill, which is, like, so old school. Like, sometimes I'm like, I know you're in the mafia, like, looking at us <laughs> over there. <laughs> um, and, like, you know, you go into these stores, and they have, like, you know, imported you know, pastries from Italy and, like, mm. espresso and, like, open squares and piazza where you can, like, sit and, like, have, like, traditional kind of, like, Italian service. So, you know, that's going on, you know, for those of you who might be less familiar with the term creolization, you know, it can apply to any number of things. In, in terms of food, we're talking about any time you have more than three cultures intersecting. Mm. And so you see this this interplay of different flavors, influences, and ideas, and it makes for a really dynamic scene in food or in any kind of culture. And the food there was bomb. So I don't know where this place is. I wasn't paying attention, and I'm going to kick myself. But <laughs> took a little excursion to... Now I'm going to be even madder at myself. Okay, I might have to come back to this, but... The town is about 30 minutes outside of Providence. Okay. And there is this one-room restaurant with no more than 12 seats. And maybe there is, like, you know, two four-tops, maybe one six-top, because we were all at the table somehow. The most transcendently delicious Guatemalan food I've ever had in my life. Wow. Okay. There's like a grandma looking type lady and like <laughs> a younger woman who I'm thinking is a, a relative of hers and they were running the whole service from kitchen mm. to front of house. Okay. So it's like being at someone's house. There was not a word spoken. You know when you're having dinner and mm-hmm. you just hear yeah, forks. just people eating. Just yeah. forks on the plate. No one's talking. There was nothing to say. <laughs> we were so busy enjoying that food. I wow. Mean, okay. So... That one definitely stands out, but... And when was this? Like, this um, is like 20 years ago when I was wow, living okay. in Providence. And, you know, it just really showed me that as much as we enjoy what we call, quote-unquote, elevated cuisine or, you know, Michelin restaurants, and, you know, I love those as well, it just takes, I would say, being real. Like, that's what it takes to make really delicious food, and that's what was taking place in this tiny restaurant Mm -hmm. that left such an incredible impression on everyone who was there. Yeah. um, So, Juan, Providence is one of my favorite New England cities to visit. I feel like it's it's very underrated and slept on. Um, I didn't know about the the sort of, like, sheltering of people who were fleeing um, wars. Mm -hmm. But whenever I'm in Providence... um, it's always very diverse in the way that other New England cities aren't. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the things that I really enjoy about it. So I'm, I have to look into that. Like, I didn't know that history. Yeah. Um, so I ask every guest this. Uh, you can name the restaurant if you want to, but you don't have to. <laughs> What's one of the worst <laughs> restaurant experiences you have ever had? Oh, man. I mean, it's going to be tough for me because I'm, I'm very forgiving and understanding, but... Uh, I mean, it's hard for me to have a bad experience because I, I tend on the side of, of optimism. I'm like, uh, whatever. But, you know, I was in a restaurant, and I'm not going to name names, but <laughs> it was in bed style and I love the place, and I've been there on numerous occasions and knew the staff. So, like, we had a good relationship. But I was there one night, and our server just was not having it. Like, she was in a visibly bad mood. And, you know, again, like, I was chilling. I had wine, so I wasn't taking it personally. But myself and my date, we were like, what is up with her? Like, what did we do? Like, she's having a hard day. <laughs> 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 so 
So like getting like cold, antagonistic, slightly indifferent service was, was disappointing, but whatever. We had a good time. It yeah. There's um Brooklyn <laughs> sometimes with the hospitality <laughs> is a mess well, for me. My my sister lives uptown and she prefers to dine in Midtown to give you a sense of where she prefers to dine and travels quite a bit and gets to see a number of places and when we make plans to go out she's like mm, no Brooklyn <laughs> no Brooklyn because sometimes you walk into no. a place and it's straight up like hostile you're just like I'm here to spend money I want to give you a tip right can like, we work on that I'm no. here to give this establishment money please don't treat me so poorly yeah again it's like laughable to me I don't take it personally I'm like you want to make money right like isn't that the whole point of you being here mm-hmm. maybe a, a smile would help I don't know <laughs> so my last question for you wait we have to stop now I know yeah this we... is terrible and disappointing but <laughs> I think I'll cope um if you could have your last meal in the restaurant where would it be and who is invited that's the first part of the question oh man where would this be? Okay. So, if I had to have my last meal, I can't tell you the name of the restaurant because I've only been in the city once and I wasn't taking notes again because I was so busy eating. But I would go to Puebla mm-hmm. in Mexico. Transcendently delicious food. I went to this taco stand, just to illustrate, called Tacos Roger unbelievable like mm. I'm you see me I'm a pretty small person like half my sandwiches over there I never eat a whole plate of anything <laughs> I'm, I'm a nibbler <laughs> so I'm eating and eating and eating and at one point I'm like oh man if I eat one more bite my eyes are gonna roll back and I'm gonna fall off the chair and I was like whatever <laughs> Just <laughs> so with that being said um I would want to go to Puebla and find a nice spot there and who would be with me and keep in mind, it can be, you know, living, dead, people you've met, ne- celebrities you might never met before, people from history. Who who would you want around that table that inspires you, that you care about? That Yes, okay, have, so... free, like, creative reign with that. Yeah, totally. So, first and foremost, Josephine Baker. Okay. She would definitely be there. That's the first time we've heard Josephine Baker on this show. I think she's such an incredible individual. I mean, if she just did the music and performance, that would be enough, right? Mm-hmm. But she was Wait, saying, she's going to perform or eat with you? No, she'll eat with me. But I'm saying, like, in terms of what she brought into the world, oh, like, yes. even if it was just entertainment, like, that in itself is phenomenal. But, like, her humanitarian work and political activism was just, like, crazy, right? So she would definitely have to be there. Okay, another individual, Rosie Perez. Okay. <laughs> I won't get too much into this story, but I once had the opportunity to serve her, and mm-hmm. we had a really uh, a nice exchange, and I would love to pick up where we left off. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I can't be contained. <laughs> so. I respect it so much. <laughs> I'm going to look back one day and be like, No. <laughs> Um, I mean, too many people. There's so many fabulous people mm-hmm. in the world. You know, obviously, I want my sister there. I have a really wonderful friend. His name is Rory Berthiaume. He actually um, styled a part of this book. Oh, wow. No okay. effects. Everybody who worked in the book will definitely be with me. Anyone who's in the acknowledgments, and y- you know who you are, you'll, you'll be there with me. And my God, I mean, my friends from Cane Club Collective, Danny DeLuna and Tom Routon and Austin, you know, we've done a lot of really great work together. I, I don't know. I could go on and on because I'm that mm. I'm that big hearted person. I'm like, I love everybody. You want like a, a big party, essentially. It'd be like, you know, like the Sermon on the Mount. You know, we'll have like the mm. one basket of fishes. And it's like, how are we going <laughs> to feed all these people? And I'll be like, believe. That's my next question is yes. what's on the table? What are people eating? Oh, man. OK, so we got to have some grilled fish. We have to have shrimp. Like it's every seafood you can think of will be there. Oysters, raw bar. Mole, and then whatever's fresh, like in terms of vegetables, that'd be it. Yeah, not much of a meat person. I'll eat it, but uh, mm-hmm. 
Mostly seafood. All, all the seafoods. Same. Yes. All the seafoods, some really amazing mezcal. Definitely we have to have some brandy, sherry. Bring me all the wines. I love the beverages. Um, I don't know. Coffee, obviously. Really good coffee. Okay. There have to be a chocolate element. That's what girls want. I don't really <laughs> do dessert, but I do chocolate. Um, I mean, that I sounds like a good meal. On. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, that's the only way to do it. That sounds like it's going until, like, 4 in the morning. Maybe 5 or 6. I mean, my favorite one is <laughs> I've, I've hosted New Year's brunches or, we, you know, we, New Year's Day. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we start serving food around 11, and then people are there at 4. I yeah, know, I was about like, to say, are 11 people? is... It's kind of early, but guess what? Early. The signature dish is my twice-brined fried chicken. I, I worked on myself. Oh, yes, honey, I can't give you the... The recipe, my sister will kill me, but it does involve two types of brine, two types of oil, and a cast iron skillet. What? It needs to be a cast iron skillet. And then, you know, our breading is proprietary. <laughs> so we have friends hitting us up like a month before. They're like, are you guys doing Are chicken? you doing brunch? You doing <laughs> Starting at 11 <laughs> yeah. is like... Yeah, because we got to we got to. You'll be you know, lucky sure if you see me at two. Okay, well, after look. After New Year's Eve. Here's the thing: we do it at eleven, and then at five, <laughs> for the people who are still there, because they're hangers on. Right. We fry another batch, so we have dinner, and then for the people who are still there at eleven. <laughs> so you see where I'm going with this. Got it. Yeah. Okay. No, that's a that's a good idea. Yeah. That's a really good idea. All right. Well, I feel like this show could go on for another hour. I mean, between, like, the book and rum and fried chicken and Josephine Baker. I mean, life but... is rich. <laughs> so you have to come back at some point. Call me. All right. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. No, thank you for having me. It's wonderful uh, confluence of events that allowed us to meet and for me to be here today, and I really appreciate it. And congratulations on this book. It's absolutely gorgeous, and it's a number one... It's number one on Amazon and, and, and pre-orders. That's fantastic. So with that being said, everyone listening, I encourage you to get your copy now while you can because the, the last major release from uh, Rizzoli in the culinary division that did this well, uh, what Tia Kernan was the art of a cheese plate, it sold out. Okay? Yes. So Tia, also a, a fellow out. former guest. Oh, right so. on. Yeah, so... Yep. Learn from that. Get your, <laughs> Get your book. Get it now. Yeah. Get it now. And where can uh, listeners follow you? So you can follow me online. Instagram is where you'll see most of what I'm up to. And it's just my first and last name. I don't have time for aliases. Shannon Mustafer, that's how you find me. Uh, you can also take a peek at my website, as I mentioned, www.shannonmustafer.com to see updates regarding my book tour. And, and uh, Mustafer is M-U-S-T-I-P-H-E-R. Correct. A little bit of a mouthful, but you can Google it and find the correct spelling. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Happy Valentine's Day. We'll catch you next week on The Hungry Society. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.